Hi, everyone, and welcome to Uncovering Presses in Unexpected Places, Latin America in print from Lisbon to Trinidad. We have four uh, participants on this panel, uh, Rachel Stein, myself, Neil Safir, Christi uh, Cristina Soriano, and Carina Zeltzman. Uh, that'll be the order that we'll be speaking. And so Rachel Stein, who is Research and Instruction Librarian at the Latin American Library at Tulane, will be our first speaker with a talk entitled Printing Spanish America in Lisbon. Are you saying that okay? Yeah, okay, great. So first of all, thank you so much, Neil, for bringing us together on this panel and to the conference organizers, and especially for the organizers dedication to making this conference bilingual. Es un placer compartir este espacio virtual con ustedes. Between 1600 and 1615, the Flemish typographer in Lisbon, Pedro Kreisbeek, printed six works treating Spanish America. Two of these are very well known. Inca Garcilaso de la Vega's The Incas Florida, and royal commentaries of the Incas. Garcilaso's works are pillars of colonial Latin American literature. And Comentarios Reales is also a landmark work of indigenous history, a chronicle dedicated solely to the pre-colonial civilizations of the Andes and penned by the first indigenous writer to my knowledge to publish in Europe. Born in Cusco, Peru in 1539 to a Spanish conquistador and Inca noblewoman, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega immigrated to Spain in 1561. He lived most of his life in the province of Cordoba, where he remotely managed the publication of three of his books. Scholars have long wondered why Garcilaso published his histories of America in Lisbon, especially because he had published his first book, the Indian's translation of Leon Hebreo's Three Dialogues of Love in Madrid in 1590. The rest of the books that Kreisbeck printed about the Spanish Indies are much lesser known. At the turn of the 17th century, a Dominican friar, Pedro Bejarano, brought two manuscripts from his Caribbean posts to Lisbon. One scene left was a sermon that Bejarano had given in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1595, a speech celebrating the Spanish defeat of Sir Francis Drake. The other scene right was an invective against the corruption of the pearl trade in Isla Margarita, which is part of current day Venezuela. While in Lisbon, Pedro Bejarano may have crossed paths with another returnee from the Indies, Martin del Barco Centenera, a former archdeacon of Paraguay, who took up other posts in the, what are now Bolivia, Peru, and Argentina over several decades in the 16th century. Barco Centenera hired Krasbeck to print his epic poem of the conquest of Argentina and the River Plate region. Finally, in 1615, Kreisbeck printed the second edition of the life that the servant of God, Gregorio Lopez, led in some parts of this new Spain. The title page is pictured left. The book was first published two years prior in Mexico City, seen right. The Lisbon bookseller Manuel Pereira snapped up the Mexican book at the Portuguese port saw its best-selling potential and put out what would be the first of many early modern European editions. It's an eclectic group, two histories, a poem, a sermon, a hagiography, and a resolution. The text spans South America, Florida, and the Caribbean. Each had its own unique path to publication, some penned and one printed in America, some written in Europe, and some with parts on the move. Now, all of the book's authors have lived in Spain's American colonies or lived there, and their text spoke to intricacies of Spanish imperial politics. Yet five of them were materialized in print for the first time in Portugal. What made Lisbon a hub of sorts in the ecosystem of Spanish American transatlantic publishing in the early 17th century? To approach that question, it's important to zoom out to see Lisbon's place in the Monarquia Hispanica, known in English as the Hispanic or Spanish monarchy. 
During the Iberian Union of Crowns from 1581 to 1640, Portugal and its overseas empire were annexed to Spain. And you can see that on this map with the Portuguese territories in yellow and the Spanish territories in orange. Krasbeck operated squarely during the Iberian Union. His was one of many presses that traversed the monarchy's European kingdoms and provinces, not only on the Iberian Peninsula, but as you can see in this map in Italy and the Low Countries as well. Overseas, there were print shops in Mexico City, Lima, Manila, Goa, and briefly Nagasaki in this time. All of these presses, while located within a single interconnected monarchy, were conditioned by very different local circumstances of production. Each kingdom, viceroyalty, and province had different book trade laws and systems of censorship. Access to materials, capital, and skilled labor also varied widely. Publishing in the Hispanic monarchy was restrictive in many ways. It was expensive and circumscribed to the elite with cumbersome censorship regulations. Yet an examination of Kreisbeek's books on Spanish America also shows that this global Iberian publishing landscape was dynamic, flexible, and highly mobile. Privileged authors and publishers had multiple options from which to choose. Their travels, personal networks, and strategic decisions moved copy across legal and commercial borders, thus connecting Spanish America to Lisbon while disconnecting colonial texts from the bureaucratic node of Madrid. Lisbon occupied a unique position at the nexus of the Spanish and Portuguese empires. Winds, weather, and piracy often forced Spanish ships to divert their courses to Seville or Cadiz and temporarily moor at the Portuguese port. <clears throat> For example, nautical conditions led Columbus to anchor in Lisbon after his first voyage. Likewise, El Inca Garcilaso de la Vega unexpectedly landed in Lisbon on his voyage from Peru, though that was decades before he would publish there. This shipping reality was fraught. Even during the Iberian Union, the lines of administration and trade of the two empires were supposed to remain separate. Yet vessels inevitably unloaded cargo illegally in Lisbon to avoid the authorities in Seville. Perhaps the Mexican edition of the life of Gregorio Lopez was unloaded illegally in, Madrid, in Lisbon, sorry, along with a traveler or along with an unexpected layover. Um, when the bookseller in Lisbon, Manuel Pereira, got his hands on it and re-edited it, he changed the book's dedicatee from the president of the Council of the Indies in Madrid to the Archbishop of Lisbon. He thus reinscribed the work in Portuguese and church rather than secular Castilian bureaucracies, framing Lopez as a potential saint of global Iberian scope and not just for the Spanish empire. In addition to maritime happenstance, Lisbon's censorship channels are key to consider. During the Iberian Union in Portugal, you needed to get licenses to print from the Portuguese Inquisition, the local ordinary, and Desembargo do Paso, or Palace Tribunal, or Supreme Court. In Castile, preventative censorship was centralized at the Consejo Real de Castilla, which farmed out licenses to those deemed appropriate. Critically, Books published in Castile, New Spain, and Peru that treated the Spanish Indies required an extra license from the Royal Council of the Indies at the court. So if you published in Portugal, you could potentially evade that key authorities watch. And there is evidence that Portuguese censors were um, lighter on controversial texts about Spain's colonies than they, and they were more interested in controversial texts about their own empire. Scholars have long speculated that Inga Garcilaso de la Vega published his histories of America in Lisbon because of their potentially subversive contents. But at least for La Florida, not notarial records in Cordoba show that Garcilaso did in fact acquire a license to print in Castile. However, the publication stalled between 1599 and 1604. Perhaps, as Pedro Givovich Perez has suggested, because the court moved from Madrid to Valladolid in 1601 and there, there was an upheaval in the printing industry, or it may have been that Garcilaso's agent, 
whom he charged with financing and overseeing the publication backed out. Maybe he didn't have the funds. Maybe he just, you know, dropped the ball basically. Um, but while the manuscript was languishing at the court, a royal chronicler plagiarized it and published Garcilaso's information and ideas in his own books. So perhaps feeling an urgency to combat the circulation of his information and ideas, Garcilaso found a new agent, Domingo de Silva, to manage the publication of La Florida and Comentarios Reales in Lisbon. So it, it's still unclear whether he ever sent his opus on the Incas to Castile, whether it was censored there or not. Um, it may have gone directly to Lisbon with the, with the history of Florida. And so he may have taken more liberties as a result, but we can't know for sure. For his part, Martin del Barco Centenera included plenty of controversial critiques of colonial officials in his epic poem of the conquest of Argentina, which may also have warranted skirting the Consejo de Indias. But that said, Barco Centenera appears to have been living in Lisbon at the time of the book's publication, since he mentions that he's the chaplain of the Viceroy of Portugal, who is also his dedicatee. So again, while it's tempting to speculate about his poems' inflammatory contents, and this is something that historians have, you know, largely like to do, it's, it's a little bit more seductive to think that these authors are publishing in Lisbon because they were being subversive. Uh, but then again, the choice could have been more of a matter of finding the closest and best press in his latest institutional role in a church and state that was united under the Spanish crown. Well, of all the texts at Krasbik's Press, Pedro Bejarano's is definitely the most directly pr provocative. His brief resolution criticizes Isla Margarita's colonial officials. Bejarano targets royal judges who were using the pearls harvested off the island as currency rather than converting them to monies. And the friar recounts that he and the governor of the island, Pedro Fajardo, joined forces to try to combat the judge's corruption. So Fajardo commissioned Bejarano to write this resolution that he later printed to appeal to the judge's consciences since they refused to acknowledge the governor's authority and uh, refused to acknowledge the king's law. But the judges couldn't be reasoned with. And Becarano recounts this, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt, or he recounts this in the dedication, and that's the evidence that we have for this. Um, so Fajardo asked Becarano to bring the text at hand to the king and the Council of the Indies of Madrid and explain what was best for the island. And Becarano expressly states this and says he was supposed to go to the court, yet he ended up publishing in Lisbon. So it's possible that he wanted to invade the Consejo de Indias by publishing in Lisbon, or that he wanted to quickly print several copies that he would then circulate when he arrived in Madrid. Because due to the quick time between when he left Isla Margarita and arrived in Lisbon, it's possible that he had one of these layovers that I mentioned before. And this brings me to a point that speed is a really important element of preventative censorship that's often overlooked when we think about censorship in this era. Lisbon censors moved much more quickly than at the court, making it an advantageous to print. And in looking at the evidence, I sometimes wonder if they actually read the whole text because sometimes they move so, so quickly. So when Inga Garcilaso de la Vega published his translation of the Dialogues of Love in Madrid, there was a 16 month lapse between the first and last licenses. And in Lisbon, it was censored over the course of just four months. So that's a whole year faster than what he had already experienced. And an even more striking case is Mateo Aleman's uh, best-selling picaresque novel, Guzman de Alfarache. The first part took 14 months to be censored in Madrid. And the second part, which was also published by Kreisbeck only has two days between the first signature and the, and the last in terms of the censorship licenses. In addition to all of these other factors of geography and sensorial politics and speed and happenstance, Krasbeck himself made Lisbon an attractive site of publication. Hailing from Antwerp, he apprenticed and rose to compositor at the Oficina Plantiniana, the most famous and renowned printing house across the Hispanic monarchy. When he immigrated to Lisbon in 1592, he brought with him this typographical prestige 
as well as Flemish merchant networks and tax breaks that went along with it. And this image shows uh, the main commercial avenue of Lisbon at the time that would have been frequented by merchants like Crasby. He was a astute businessman who quickly became the favored printer of local institutions. He tripled the output of his competitors. He had a well-stocked shop and he had access to materials like copper engravings, prints, and specialized type that really made him stand out against other local and peninsular printers. So I'm concluding this presentation without entirely solving these six publication puzzles. And you may have noticed I used maybe and perhaps quite a lot, and I am actually okay with that. Um, the documentation at hand still requires a degree of speculation and ambiguity. And I don't think that what's most important is finding the definitive answer of why these people published in Lisbon, but rather opening up a question, why Lisbon? It's a path to illuminating the transatlantic and transimperial dimensions of Spanish American publishing in the age of global monarchy. And these stories are often obscured by na nation centric historiographies. The authors and publishers we've seen extracted the court and its councils from books that were in many ways destined for eyes and ears in Madrid. The patchwork territories of the Spanish monarchy offered varying politics, speeds, and materials of printing, so bookmakers could mix and match jurisdictions, making Lisbon an alternative court from which to voice visions of the Spanish Indies that may never have seen the light in Castile. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a fabulous uh, presentation and really launches us well on our, on our project. Okay, so um, my, the next presentation is, is my own. Uh, it is called Printing Books at uh, the Blind Man's Arch. What constitutes a Latin American press during the colonial period in the Americas? Is it a press run by those born and raised in the colonial region, operated on Latin American soil? Or is it possible to say that any press run by Latin Americans, be it in Lisbon or in London, could be considered part of the long history of printing in Latin America? Is Kromberger's satellite operation in Mexico City run by the Italian printer Giovanni Paoli, a Latin American press, a European press, or are these distinctions somewhat arbitrary? I think we've already seen how um, the Latin American world is a transnational and transgeographical world, and that identities shift and also um, adapt themselves to different circumstances. As we know, books are also go-betweens, mediating devices that provide a mechanism for communicating one's individual knowledge or the collective knowledge of a group of authors to another group or individual. Of course, books themselves are also mediated by the mechanisms that are used to compile them, to translate them, to transport them, and of course, to print them. As physical objects, they are subject to human intervention and indeed require mediation for them to have any function whatsoever. In addition to providing some early history about the printing of books in Brazil, much of my presentation today gestures toward the ways that books were border crossers in the 18th century, using the case of the Portuguese print house called the Tipografia do Arco do Cego, or the typography at the blind man's, uh, blind man's arch. In this story, the figure of José Mariano da Conceição Veloso, a polymath Franciscan friar who was born in Brazil uh, and played a key role in the development of this project, is also paramount. A go-between par excellence, Veloso spent five decades in his native Brazil, in the captaincies of Minas Gerais, where he was born, but also Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and Espírito Santo, before arriving in Lisbon, where he masterminded the production of a staggering array of texts related to Brazil, the Americas, and much more, as we'll see. He also mentored a group of Brazilian-born elites who took a very active role in the construction and consolidation of a transatlantic intellectual community at the end of the 18th century across uh, the Atlantic. This circle would eventually carry out a publication program that attempted to reorient the Portuguese economy from one that merely relied on the extraction of resources to one that could be based upon agro-technical innovations 
acquired through the careful study, and in some cases, the local adaptation of foreign techniques and practices. Later, the same knowledge and technology would be carried across the ocean, literally, in the hold of a ship called the Medusa in 1807, uh, with the departure of the Portuguese royal family when, they, uh, when the Iberian Peninsula was invaded by um, Napoleon. As such, it would constitute the raw materials for the Impressão Regia, or royal print house, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, so I want to uh, start here by talking, uh, uh, showing three of the books that I usually showed to Brazilian visitors at the John Carter Brown Library. Um, one is the Brasilsha Geldsack. Uh, published in 1647, which was thought for a while to be the first book published in Brazil. As you can see, it's printed, uh, it says that it's printed in Recife in 1647, but in fact, it was later found out to be a false imprint, uh, a libelous track against the directors of the West Indies Company, um, and part of a larger propaganda campaign during the time that the Dutch had invaded northeastern Brazil, which is a very important part of Brazilian history um, and that I don't have time to get into today, but it's important um, uh, to know about it. So that's a false moment of printing in Brazil. The second moment uh, that I want to talk about is the, or just re reference briefly, is um, Antonil's Cultura e Opulencia do Brasil, which was an extremely rare edition that was produced in Lisbon by an Italian Jesuit that gave precious information about mines and other precious resources of Brazil's interior. Um, it was printed, we don't know how many in how many copies, but only seven of those copies exist today because the, uh, essentially the crown decided that it revealed too much about the interior of Brazil would be used potentially by the competitors uh, of the Portuguese. And, um, and so this is one of the prime copies that's now digitized and fully available online. So again, no printing yet in Brazil. Um, the first uh, acknowledged uh, print, printing uh, item, printed item, is this text on the, th the third, which is Antonio Isodora da Fonseca, a printer known in Lisbon for producing works of well-known authors, his Relação da Entrada que fez Don Antonio do Destejo Malheiro. Um, it's unclear why Fonseca, who was well-known and, and relatively successful in Lisbon, would come to Brazil. He may have been a new Christian. We know the Inquisition was not far away uh, because Fonseca actually printed three texts of somebody who was burned at the stake. Uh, by the Inquisition. Uh, what we do know is that he did have some issue with his creditors. He sold his business, set up shop in Brazil, um, and within six months, it was closed down as well. So that um, was a kind of a false start for um, the printing in Brazil. However, from 1808, when the first printing press came on, you can see that these are some of the earliest uh, examples of materials that we actually, that were printed on Brazilian soil. Um, government documents, histories, and this, this memoir of, of the history of the invasion of the French of Portugal, which for obvious reasons. And then this text on the right, the Observações sobre a Canela, which is a text that um, recuperates a 1798 memoir on the hist natural history of the region of Rio de Janeiro, but is reprinted. And it's, an, it's a very good example of the way that printing presses uh, in Brazil and in Latin America more generally, recuperated natural knowledge that was being produced throughout the colonial period, but wasn't necessarily being circulated uh, because of the lack of a press. So the Arco do Sego uh, text, uh, print house, should be seen in the context of these efforts, because it was of great interest uh, for the Portuguese so to circulate useful knowledge from Europe to the colonies. This is precisely what the Arco do Sego did. During the years of its brief existence from 1799 to 1801, the Arco do Sego produced a wide range of texts, all of which were published under the auspices of the Portuguese Minister of Overseas and Naval Affairs, Dom Rodrigo de Souza Cochinho. Texts were produced on the acclimatization of new species, maritime commerce, works of a nautical nature, uh, and others, most of which served to legitimate the publication project as part of the minister's dossier. 
And I just, again, want to uh, run through quickly some of the kinds of texts that were produced um, during this period uh, under the auspices of uh, Concesão Veloso, not necessarily of the Arco do Sego. And again, the relationship between these different presses is part of the story here. And it's uh, relevant because uh, it's, not a, it's not a simple relationship. Uh, many of the images, for instance, of uh, the uh, Lisbon presses in the latter part of the 18th century were produced by the Arco do Sego, um, but weren't necessarily used in its own publications. So here um, you have some uh, different versions of hemp treatises, again by Conceição Veloso. Uh, you have a text uh, written on, on the cultures of North American natural history, uh, that was published by and translated by Veloso, um, published by uh, Rodriguez Gallardo. Um, but the map that you see on the left-hand side was actually produced in the, in the Arco do Sego uh, office. And so the, the uh, idea of visual imagery, and this is connected to uh, the Encyclopédie project and others, which is trying to create the technology uh, for these projects uh, is very relevant here. Uh, you also have celestial uh, text and treatises on the celestial spheres. This is a translation of the famous British Atlas of Flamsteed. Um, and then also very much to the point, transportable plants from Mexico, uh, cochineal uh, and, and the Nopal in this, in this case, um, but also from India. So throughout the broader Portuguese uh, empire. And here's an example of the Arco do Sego imprints themselves, which as you can see, draw directly on the kinds of texts that were being produced um, in Lisbon at the, at the time. Uh, and again, some, some images of, of this. Now, one of the important sources for the study of the Arco do Sego is housed in the archive of the Imprensa Nacional Casa da Moeda. Through these documents, which I've only begun to work on uh, recently, it's possible to see the day-to-day -day activities of the press from the perspective of the royal coffers. Um, here in this document, for instance, we see the broad array of actors that came together to produce uh, the work, the, the diverse works of the Arco do Sego. Narciso Ferreira and Antonio Joaquin for book bindings that they produce. Uh, Paulo dos Santos Ferreira, who provided uh, bags of coal uh, for some part of this process. Romão Eloy Dalmeida, director of the engravers for projects that had been completed in January, listing the exact amount of money that was spent. Um, and finally, to the poet Manuel Mar Maria Barbosa du Bocage, who is a very famous neoclassical poet uh, known in, por in Portugal during this time for the translation that he had undertaken. So these, um, this is really, these, these materials offer an incredible uh, and, and very rich panorama of the activities of the Arco do Sego. These uh, the individuals, some of whom were Brazilian, some of whom were Portuguese, produced the raw materials that were not only part of the Arco do Sego, but that would also be incorporated into the Impressão Reja in Brazil, since many of the uh, objects, material objects, ended up getting passed along. And I'll end my presentation actually showing you an example of that. Now, uh, back to Veloso's uh, role, he was not only a mentor to a generation of Brazilians, but he was also a translator. And in his role as translator, he played the role of mediator through his prefatory materials. In a large number of cases, taking advantage of the topic being addressed within uh, the text to make a connection between the material world on one hand and the textual world. In this way, in this preface that you see to the historical and physical treatise on bees, Veloso uses the insect itself to demonstrate the role of mediation and the role of print. The bee is that small animal, he writes, that gave humankind its first idea of sweetness, a quality most agreeable to the human palate. The bee also hides within its wax the solar rays that assist us in the darkness of the night. Published under the auspices of the Arco do Sego in 1800, Veloso uses the figure of, bee, of the bee as an insect 
that transforms pollen into honey and whose wax is then later transformed into light. I see here a kind of a metaphor, almost as if Veloso is transforming himself into the figure of the bee that is traveling from one flower to the other in order to interpret new fields of knowledge and give a Portuguese flavor that would then disperse itself through the printed medium. And he does this not only in that case, but in a whole range of different texts. Uh, this is a, a, a text on uh, estrumis or manure, um, where he talks about the utility that results for uh, rural planters and the sacred duty of the intellectual husband to fertilize the field, just like the translator's duty is to transform this material into um, other kinds of um, of knowledge. This transmission of knowledge through these editorial pathways was according to Veloso, not only a sacred duty of the cultivator, but also what he called a sublime, sublime object of this noble productive science. And so you see him moving as a naturalist himself from the agricultural through the prefatory to the realm of a print, tracing it um, together. So um, uh, I want to conclude by looking at us with a slightly wider lens at the broader Portuguese world of which figures like uh, Veloso and others who participated in this process were operating. The Portuguese historian uh, Diogo Ramada Curto has referred to a specific form of Portuguese cosmopolitanism that understood its imperial possessions in Europe, Africa, Asia, and especially Brazil as a special kind of unified polity, um, a political system in which the metropole was not a significantly different space than any other Portuguese territory, and where any Portuguese that was born in the four parts of the globe considered himself or herself strictly Portuguese, and only recognized the glory and grandeur of the monarchy to, to which they had the fortune to belong. Economic systems, in turn, uh, were meant to be flexible, and overseas colonies were not only meant to be sources for raw materials and agricultural goods. Rather, these regions, too, should be able to compete in the creation of manufactured products. And it was for this reason that the Arco do Sego emphasized to such a degree the assembly of machines and schemes for independent product, pr the independent production of engines and technical devices. And from this perspective, it's important uh, to show this, this final document, which is essentially a list of books, uh, many of which were from the Arco do Sego that were sent in 1799 from metropolitan Portugal to Brazil. Um, there are very few actually book, actual book lists that we have like this. And so this one is a real treasure that is held at the um, National Library in, uh, in Rio. You can see uh, treatises on the history of worms. You can see on the culture of hemp production. Uh, you can even see a memoir on the subject of the production of blue cheese, um, which I don't think ever quite got off the ground in Brazil. Um, but uh, it's that effort and that desire for this incredible to diversify the production that you see here uh, quite, uh, quite clearly. From these book lists then, we see that the interests of the Arco do Sego uh, extended far beyond national or even in some cases, imperial frontiers. They extended to the mythical figures that inhabited the heavens, to the tropics, from the culture of Indian nutmeg to the vast empire of the Amazon river from American illnesses to the universal system of natural history, including orangutans. And Fray Veloso served as the central axis. Uh, axis. The French historian Philippe Minard had wrote in his book, Le Typographe des Lumières, the men who are active at the printing presses in the 18th century are the heirs, proud and deserving at the same time of a long artisanal tradition. At the Arco do Sego, the artisans of the Luso-Brazilian Enlightenment owe much to the figures of people like Veloso, who managed to develop between two distinct patrias, his own material itineraries of knowledge. The arrival of the Portuguese court to Rio in 1808 
only sealed this patriotic tradition, spurred on not only by the desire for natural knowledge of a new imperial capital, but also by the physical materials, including these copper plates from the Arco do Sego that made their way into the collections of the Royal Library and were brought over in 1808. These were vestiges of these broader efforts to capture Brazilian nature in print. They form part of a larger itinerary of printed matter that began before printing arrived on Brazilian shores, but became consolidated with the retreat of the Braganza dynasty to Brazil in 1807, which set in motion a whole series of other histories in print and other media that others will have the pleasure of recounting at a later, at a later date. Thanks to all of you. Gracias, obrigado. And now uh, we turn things over to Cristina Soriano. So now we're going to hear from Cristina Soriano, who is Associate Professor of Latin American History at uh, Villanova University and the author of Tides of Revolution, Information, Insurgencies, and the Crisis of Colonial Rule in Venezuela. She is going to talk to us on the subject of uh, a, a peripheral press. Take it away, Cristina. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for inviting me to this wonderful panel. And thank you for the organizers. And um, as I mentioned to Neil, when he invited me, this is like a research that's ongoing. And I just gonna share like general thoughts about what's what I'm finding. My new project is on the island of Trinidad and the kind of a trans-imperial uh, character nature of Trinidad between the Spanish uh, uh, monarchy and the British empire. But um, particularly speaking about a press that was found in Trinidad uh, functioning during 1786, and, and we'll see what, what the story is. So it was February 1800s when the members of the white elite of the captaincy in Venezuela, uh, which was a pretty peripheral Spanish American province, addressed a letter to the King of Spain in which they sought permission to establish a printing press in Caracas, the capital city of the province of Venezuela. In the letter, they argued that the establishment of such a press was a fundamental uh, kind of a, um, issue for the economic and commercial development of the capitalism. And I quote, with a printing press, the experienced farmers will communicate with other fellows countrymen all the knowledge they have obtained in their fields in order to improve the crops. Artists will do the same for the benefit of their class and other citizens will feel encouraged to share the product of their shores. The petition was probably motivated by these difficulties that most Venezuelans encountered when trying to find books from the Iberian Peninsula or even from Mexico. But uh, above all, these documents show this deep interest that Venezuelans had in fomenting the circulation of their own local knowledge, of becoming producers of their own knowledge. Months later, they learned that the Spanish crown had denied the permission for them to have a printing press. Without a clear explanation for, this restricti for restricting this privilege, Venezuela became one of the last provinces of Spanish American to possess the technology. It was not until 1808, in the midst of the Spanish monarchical crisis due to the Napoleonic invasion, that Venezuela finally obtained a permission to have a printing press, and it was one that was exclusively used to print text supporting the rights of Ferdinand VII. The reasons why the printing press came so late to Venezuela have been subject to interesting debates, and most of the scholars argue that by the time Venezuela acquired some economic and commercial relevance within the Iberian Empire, uh, the menace of the circulation of enlightened and revolutionary ideas in the Atlantic world triggered this kind of a crown's concern about establishing printing presses in regions that were potentially vulnerable uh, to foreign influence. So if we look into you know, Venezuela with an open and vast coast space in the Caribbean Sea, it seems like the province in particular was those, one of those that needed close vigilance and control from the metropolitan power. I have discussed in previous works, including my book, that the lack of printing press in mainland Venezuela did not prevent Venezuelan public from exchanging and participating in an incipient public sphere that was fed by the vibrant and dynamic circulation of papers, pamphlets, and newspapers within the Caribbean net. But more interestingly, historical records reveal that a small printing press was operating in Port of Spain in the island of Trinidad in 1786. During this time, Trinidad was part of the captaincy of Venezuela, which was incorporated by royal decree in 1777. So therefore, we can safely assert that the first Venezuelan press operated illegally 
or at least in these guys in this peripheral island of Trinidad. But how did the printing press arrive in Trinidad and how did that or not? These are some of the questions I will try to address uh, today in this short presentation. And as I said before, since this is an ongoing research, the purpose is for me to share general thoughts about the functioning or the role of this press in a trans-imperial, multicultural, multilingual reality of Trinidad. Today, most scholars characterize the Caribbean region as a space that compromised both island and continental coasts, a space that was not exclusively a dominion of a single European state, but rather simultaneously, and I quote Ernesto Bassi, Spanish, British, French, Dutch, indigenous, and African. In fact, recent work have shown the entangled and hybrid character of the greater Caribbean region that was trans-imperial, and where there's trans-imperial connections allow free and slave black and white people to move beyond imperial frontiers to change goods, technologies, ideas, information, especially during the age of revolution. These movements and exchanges had a profound impact on different Caribbean colonies, uh, changing the demographic and economic developments, producing new social tensions and altering the political and ideological debates of the time. As Vanessa Mongi have shown, and I quote, portable printing presses, which could be easily carried on board ships or across tracts of land, played an important role in the revolutionary Caribbean. Precisely because, end of the quote, precisely because they allow the movement of ideas and discourses connecting the Caribbean population in a profound moment of crisis and change. Although originally the printing press that operated in Trinidad around 1786 was established with the goal of communicating the government's decision and new regulations, the revolutionary wave that rise in the Caribbean during the last decade of the 18th century transformed this little press in an instrument of revolution and the Spanish crown held the urge to stop its operation. So let me tell you a little bit about how we found out about this printing press. So it was Charles IV of Spain who became deeply concerned about the effects of the French Revolution and its propaganda in the Spanish American territories. In September 1789, for example, he was informed by the members of the National that he was informed, I'm sorry, that members of the National Assembly in Paris we're trying to smuggle into Spanish America at the seditious manifesto that will, I quote, shake the power of the Spanish dominion among its inhabitants. Between 1789 and 1791, there are multiple royal decrees restricting the entry of French books and newspapers, prohibiting those whose content was considered dangerous to religion due to subordination and social order. Likewise, in 1790, the Castle of Castile prohibited the introduction of any French newspaper, revolutionary catechisms, and books related to the French Revolution. Venezuelans had access to foreign newspapers, broadsides, and pamphlets that were smuggled through the Caribbean connections into the mainland. Several written texts from France, Saint Domingue, and Trinidad, in printed or manuscript form, were collected by officials in different towns of Venezuela. In fact, between 1793 and 1808, Officials continuously reported about the ease with which these papers circulated in the region. Among these texts, there are uh, political proclamations, letters, a Spanish translation of papers published by the National Assembly, uh, texts written by French agents appointed in Spanish Santo Domingo after the Treaty of Basel in 1795. And there are several copies of crucial political texts like the social contract, the Declaration of the Independence of the United States, the rights of man and the citizen, the last will of Louis uh, XVI, the King of France, and the Declaration of Independence in Haiti. All of those texts found their way to Venezuela, where they even suffered discursive and narrative adaptations to make them more comprehensible for the population at large. These ephemeral texts arrived at the, to the mainland ports and cities through different ways. In one hand, we have Spanish and foreign visitors who always carry uh, books and pamphlets and gadgets with them, and they were happy to share them with locals in either private meetings or even in semi-public meetings. But secondly, we have smuggling webs that made very effective uh, for merchants and smugglers to introduce prohibited texts in, into the Venezuelan coast. Uh, especially because, as I said before, the geographic, the geography of Venezuela with such a vast coast made it particularly easy for them to smuggle these texts. Now, in December 1789, the Venezuelan Captain General Juan Guillermi reported that to the authorities in Madrid that since the month of August, I quote, the assets, dailies, and supplements from or about France providing news about the current events in Paris have entered Venezuela. 
according to Guillermo, and I quote again, the evil designs of this text and of the quote represented a da great danger for the captaincy. As a result, he was really ready to use all possible means to protect the province from this, I quote, revolutionary contagion that has shaken the world. So he extended his order to the governors of the six provinces that compromised Venezuela. And he asked them to collect all potential dangerous papers that are found in their territories. In Trinidad, the governor of the island, Jose Maria Chacón, took very drastic steps. In January 1790, he condemned to exile the French writer and printer of the Gaceta de Trinidad. His name was Jean-Baptiste Villot. Because, I quote, he had copied and printed diverse articles of public foreign newspapers about the current revolution in France, in which were published many subversive phrases, contrary to the good order of our constitution, to spread dissension, corrupt the true faith, and disturb the good order of our rule. End of the quote. Apparently, the printer had not foreseen the consequences of his actions. But the fact that Trinidad even had a printing press was even more concerning. As I mentioned earlier, Caracas, elites and many other people in important cities of Venezuela and New Granada lack printing presses because the crown had denied their residents the permission to have one. Yet, the small island of Trinidad possessed a press that printed papers about news and current events. How and why did Trinidad obtain this printing press is not completely clear and I'm still working on that but it's certainly operating illegally. The little significance and peripheral nature of Trinidad probably allowed for the entry and functioning of a printing press and the creation of the Gaceta de Trinidad was an event that passed unnoticed to Venezuelan and Spanish authorities. And although Chacon never explained why there was a printing press in Trinidad in the first place, he confirmed that following royal orders, he had gotten rid of it. I quote, it was my intention to prevent the evil or to eliminate it at its origins without alarming the public or provoking its curiosity about the reasons for my decision. Different news will make people talk about things that are better left in silence. But this quote is very interesting because Chacon is saying that he's, you know, expelling the printer from Trinidad in, in a kind of a, um, a very um, low profile way because he wants to keep things in silent. He doesn't want to raise the attention of the public. But it, it looks like he doesn't want to attend to, to, to bring attention to the fact that Trinidad had a printing press under his orders and he was using that printing press himself. According to historian Roderick Cave, Juan Vilox is a disguised name which with the real editor remain hidden. Vilox was in fact a man named F.J. Willops Duwai a printer and editor who moved around different Caribbean islands, especially Martinica and Dominica, where he published different, a variety of newspapers. In Dominica, he became the editor of the periodical publication Le Fure Colonial. And in one of his numbers published in 1791, this is after he was expelled from Trinidad, he confessed that he used to be the editor of the Gaceta de Trinidad or Courier de la Trinidad Español, which in my opinion, it's showing that it was a bilingual newspaper and he was arbitrarily expelled from the island. Later in 1793, Willox turned up again, again as the imprimeur du government in Saint Pierre, Martinique. But even more intriguing is to discover that this itinerant editor and printer, I'm talking about Willox, was not the first one operating a printing press in Trinidad. A 12-page booklet found by Jose Toribio Medina in the Archivo de Indias in Seville, entitled Ordenanza Publicada en el Puerto de España el 11 de agosto de 1786, it's a uh, um, royal order published in Port Spain in August 1786, was published in the printing house of Juan Cassan in Port Spain. Juan Cassan is probably the French printer Jean Cassan, who in 1779 had been the printer of the Gazette Royale de la Granada in Fort Royal in Granada, in Grenada. The close connection between Grenada and Trinidad probably allowed the later to move to Trinidad with a printing press that was used to publish laws and regulations created by the government of Trinidad, Jose Maria Chacón. So although Trinidad had not received royal permission to have a printing press, the governor had on his own 
authorized establishment of a printed press that he used that he used to support his government and keep Trinidarians informed about his decisions. But perhaps we need a little bit more context about what's happening in Trinidad and why he had this uh, Grenadian printer coming to the island. So it was in the mid of the 1770s that the Spanish crown had moved Trinidad, a neglected island with a stagnant economy and a very poor population, to the center of 18th century Spanish urban reforms. The crown wanted to revitalize this geographically strategic post by integrating the island into the captaincy of Venezuela while establishing an agricultural and commercial program to reproduce the slave-based plantation economy of the West Indies. To achieve this, the Crown implemented innov innovative migration policies that sought to attract foreign Catholic planters and merchants to settle in Trinidad and bring their capital and slave uh, workers into the island. The Crown also fought to create commercial bridges that connected the island with the Spanish main bring about new visions of Spanish American expansion and increasing competition with other European powers present in the Caribbean. Within one decade, meaning between 1717, 1777 and 1787, these different imperial strategies turned Trinidad into a diverse and plural society that was inhabited mostly by French, white Catholic planters and free people of color from Granada, enslaved black people who were forced to move with their enslavers, and some Spanish white and part of the families and, and British merchants. It also turned to be an economically promising colony that required the careful orchestration on the part of local colonial officials like Chacon, foreign migrants like this large population of people coming from Granada and imperial agents working in, Gana in Caracas and Madrid. In a very long report written in September 1787, to the Spanish Secretary of the State, Governor Chacon provided a very optimistic picture of the economic, commercial, and social development that Trinidad was experiencing. Chacon presented evidence of how Trinidad's economy was slowly but steadily recovering thanks to the successful cultivation and trade of cotton, cacao, indigo, and coffee, and also how its healthy trade was allowing Trinidad's residents to acquire needed manufacturing goods. Still, Chacon believed that there was room for improvement, and I quote, a solid agriculture and burgeoning commerce depend on the stable judicial and political system, but also on an increased population, I end of the quote. In his opinion, it was necessary to continue inviting more foreign planters from the French islands to move to Trinidad and to convince the crown to continue investing on the slave trade. According to Chacon, French colonies not only brought experience and knowledge to the island, and I quote again, but they brought tools, products, furniture, provisions, and slaves who are very valuable. End of the quote. Among those valuable tools brought about by the Grenadian immigrants, of course, was the printing press. And this is, you know, what I found is very interesting because Chacon is like going beyond his uh, jurisdiction, going beyond his power to allow a printing press to come to Trinidad. But the main purpose of that printing press is precisely to fulfill this kind of a reformist impulse or spirit to bring technology and share knowledge within the small island. He never communicated, at least I haven't found a letter yet, I'm still searching for it. He never communicated that he was allowing a printing press to work to function on the island of Trinidad. Despite his positive take on migration, in this report, Chacon also recognized that bringing more French residents also represented a challenge. I quote, we are in need, he claimed, to populate this island at the expense of our rivals while defending it from them. It was therefore imperative to keep the new colonies, meaning these French immigrants from Grenada and other French islands, it's important to keep them happy and loyal to the crown, to help them prosper through a government that rules with, I quote, justice, equity, and that treats them in the fair liberty of the rights of men. Now, as the French Revolution erupted in the summer of 1789, and the meanings of words like justice, liberty, and rights that Chacon was referring to in his report suffer radical change, the Captain General of Venezuela and Governor Chacon himself faced a new impossible challenge, keeping France and the French Revolution off the minds and lips of Trinidad's French population and away from the Spanish main. So despite of colonial officials' willingness to be vigilant on the circulation of written news 
a vast amount of documentation showed that this situation was very difficult to control. Governor Chacon, for example, insisted that he was guarding against the entry of seditious texts, but that he was concerned that this could easily enter Trinidad from the French Windward Islands or directly from Saint Domingue because the administration simply lacked the capacity to monitor the entire coast of Venezuela and its islands. For Chacon, it was not logistically, it was logi logistically impossible. I'm sorry, for Chacon, it was not only logistically impossible, but contradictory to run investigations on French presidents or to control their actions and words. The only promise Chacon could make was to pay careful attention to the new families and reject potential, I quote, dangerous characters. In a 1791 letter to the Spanish minister, he expressed that although he was trying to control the circulation of news about the revolution in the island, this was almost an impossible task. And this was probably the reason why he had to certainly expel the, printed, the printer from the island. The small printing press that was originally and illegally brought to the island to support its transformation within the mindset of the Spanish reformism, reformism was abruptly silenced because it has become a tool of sedition and revolution. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cristina, for that incredibly rich and, and fascinating project. And we look forward to hearing many, much, much more in the oh future. Oh my God, there's so much. I... Okay, so our final speaker for this panel is Corinna Zeltzman, who is Assistant Professor of History at Georgia Southern University and author of the very, very recently published Ink Under the Fingernails, Printing Politics in 19th Century Mexico, published by the University of California Press. Uh, her talk today is going to be entitled Selling Scandal. Take it away, Corinna. Thank you, Neil. And thanks to everyone for being here um, for, for the invitation and really looking forward for, to our conversation. Um, I'm going to be uh, drawing from my new book project or my new book um, in my presentation today. And the, the book explores conflicts, uh, how conflicts over printing shaped broader debates about press freedom and authorship in 19th century Mexico. and uh, I just want to thank uh, also AFA, recognize AFA, which helped to fund the research for that project when I was a, a graduate student. So I hope those of you who are doing research are aware of, of AFA's um, uh, fellowship, scholarship prizes. Um, take a look if, if you're not. Um, so I'm going to zoom in today on this one case of a provocative French novel, um, The Mysteries of the Inquisition, which was published in Paris in 1844 and reprinted in Mexico in 1850 where it caused an uproar in the press and was banned by the Catholic Church. So I'm, I'm continuing our theme uh, of the transnational kind of circulation of, of books and texts. Um, so what does a Gothic romance that was first published in Paris tell us about mid 19th century Mexico? Um, the novel's local trajectory really reveals how the business of printing intersected with one of the most important political conflicts that shaped Mexican state formation, which was the struggle to figure out the relationship between the, the relatively new nation state and the nation's wealthiest institution in the Catholic church. So my presentation is gonna walk us through the reprinting and the fallout over the mysteries. Uh, it's gonna explore the conflicts that shaped how press freedom and censorship were negotiated on the ground in the decades following independence and in keeping with our, our panel's themes, it's gonna highlight a little bit the transnational currents that fueled liberal efforts to free the printing press, um, thinking about books as mediating objects, but also as mediated through, through uh, printing technologies, um, as well as the, the centrality of printers as partisan activists who developed new interpretations of law and authority as they navigated sticky situations associated with printing scandals. So you're gonna understand a little bit better how the novel became a lightning rod for debate about the role of the Catholic Church when I talk a little bit about its plot. Uh, it was an explosive critique of institutional religion. The plot brings readers to 15th century Seville, follows the virginal heroine Dolores as she tries to evade the scheming designs of the grand inquisitor, Pedro Arbues, who um, she eventually succeeds and escapes to the Protestant Netherlands where she lives happily ever after. Uh, and the novel's illustrations, which you can see here, really affect, uh, enhance the plot's message, 
um, depicting gruesome scenes of torture, half naked women being flogged in dungeons. And on the right, you can see the, the inquisitor himself propositioning a virgin in her bedchamber. Um, so it wasn't long before the mysteries provoked an outcry and drew the attentions of the church itself. Now, I wanna give a little bit of context just to make the stakes of this, the mysteries production clearer. Um, Anti-Catholic literature, like uh, you, might, you might situate the mysteries as a kind of example of anti-Catholic literature. Um, this, this kind of literature circulated widely in the Atlantic world during the 19th century. The mysteries is not quite this. It was co-authored by a, a French poet, Victorine Germillon, writing under a pseudonym and her Spanish exiled uh, liberal partner, uh, Manuel Quindias. Really, this emerges out of a Catholic context where liberal reformers uh, were using sensationalized images of the Catholic past to advance a program to modernize and subordinate the church under new national governments. And so this was a process that was also unfolding in Mexico, where by the mid 19th century, the Mexican church is a beleaguered institution, but it's still a really important force in everyday life. And it's the nation's largest landowner. Catholicism is official religion, which reflected the search for a kind of compromise, a, a creation of a Catholic or a Catholic form of liberalism, um, where the, you know, the nation's founders embraced constitutionalism, but maintain Catholicism as a state religion. Um, but in the years after independence in 1821, this had become a point of contention between um, the factions that, that vied for control. Um, liberals were in favor of curtailing church privileges further. Uh, conservatives wanted to defend the church's centrality in public affairs. And these tensions we can see play out in debates over the limits and policing uh, of freedom of the press. So in theory, you know, freedom of the press was guaranteed in Mexico's constitution, but, um, but uh, the church was theoretically uh, invested with authority to censor religious imprints. And authors and publishers were supposed to submit manuscripts for prior uh, church approval, and the state was supposed to help enforce church authority. Um, but in practice, you know, the consensus surrounding the enforcement of press freedom was pretty um, elusive in practice. And, um, and we'll see that when we, when we think about the, the trajectory of the mysteries. Um, now, a Spanish translation that had originally been printed in New Orleans is going to provide the copy that um, for the Mexican, the Mexico City edition of the mysteries, which first appears in the radical newspaper El Monitor Republicano in 1850. And it touches off this polemic that rages for six months in the press. Um, and Mexico City's newspapers had really been inseparable from partisan politics since Mexico's independence. But uh, after Mexico loses um, to the US Army in 1848, the press contributes to deepening political divisions and a political crisis, which would eventually break out into a civil war uh, in 1857. So in 1850, however, the lines of this brewing conflict were still being drawn, and they were drawn by three major newspapers that represented conservative, moderate, and liberal, or I'm sorry, conservative, moderate, and radical perspectives. Um, each of these newspapers owned and operated by Mexico City printers who had leveraged patronage networks to build really exceptional careers and public reputations. Uh, and the figure I'll be focusing most on today is Vicente Garcia Torres, who emerges as, as this um, central figure. He doesn't come up with the idea to reprint the mysteries himself. He actually steals the edition from his rival, the liberal printer Ignacio Cumplido, and uh, also promises to produce a book edition with illustrations. And Garcia Torres really had built a reputation uh, over the 1840s as this kind of maverick and opposition figure. He had been exiled by 1850. He had led a regiment of citizen soldiers against the US invasion. Um, he often attracted criticism for his political tactics from, you know, in private. Uh, and people often looked down on him as a kind of undereducated figure um, due to his humble origins. And I just touch on his trajectory because um, I want to underscore the links between printers, public images. Um, their political connections and their business strategies. So figures like Garcia Torres, just like all pr the major printers of the day, really staked their fortunes on uh, relationships, uh, political relationships and printed works that, that advanced political positions. So business and politics were really intertwined. And, and that's part of 
uh, you know, everybody knew this and that was part of the sort of repertoire of, of politics. So it's not really surprising that as soon as he began to serialize uh, the mysteries in his newspaper, his rival in the conservative um, newspaper, El Universal, jumped into the fray. And you actually have this polemic that goes on for the entire summer, which buys time for institutional actors to weigh in. And by September, the interim archbishop had uh, of Mexico had banned the book and actually reached out to the state for material enforcement. Um, to asking the, the Ministry of Justice and Ecclesiastical Affairs to sort of seize the edition, right? Because it, it violated church, um, church laws. And, um, you know, I outlined before the way that the law laid out a kind of collaborative relationship between the church and the state over religious censorship, but how does this really work in practice? Um, you know, in, in practice, government documents show that, that officials in the state had really not been interested in, in cooperating with the church and church officials had struggled to enforce religious prohibitions, had sort of given up for a while. And uh, after 1848, however, the church is trying to renew uh, its efforts to assert its power. So the, the novel's censorship really reflects a, a new strategy on the part of the church. Um, and in response, the publisher of the novel, uh, Garcia Torres, wrote to state officials and essentially asked the state to intervene and reverse the church's excommunication decree. Uh, and he accuses, um, he, he recasts religious censorship as, as an attack on the state constitution. Um, and he argues, quote, the ecclesiastical authority must subject itself to the political and civil laws to prohibit the reading and retention of an imprint is to attack freedom of the press and the right of property guaranteed by our laws. So the printer recasts books, not as a sort of moral, um, uh, you know, text with moral implications, but as objects, right? Private property that needed to be protected from the, uh, by the state from religious overreach. And this is a configuration that essentially demands an overhaul of the rules of censorship and of the church state relationship more broadly. Uh, but state officials are not so keen to just jump into the, to the fray and they are, are more cautious and take stock of the church state relationship as a result of this case. Um, the Ministry of Justice reaches out to his counterparts in the, uh, in the church who and asks if they had followed the right procedures in their protocols. Um, the archbishop admits that they hadn't and he follows up though by a sort of countering that the governments had themselves failed to follow the laws. So there's this sort of tit for tat argument about non-compliance um, that leads the church to, you know, to kind of point its finger back at the state uh, as the guilty party. And you know, the archbishop, in addition to really forcefully criticizing the state, um, pivots in his letter because he knows he's kind of cornered and tries to salvage the church's position by cutting a deal with the state. And he basically asks the, uh, the state to uh, only help target the illustrated version of the novel, the, the standalone book. But he promises to leave the newspaper edition, the serialized version of the novel alone. Uh, and in this way, he's kind of pitching in a way that it appeals to the minister's social status as a, what we would call an hombre de bien, a respectable male member of society, um, the Archbishop admitted that well-to-do Mexicans who read the news would not be happy about parting with their complete sets of newspapers. Um, Mexican newspaper readers often compiled their newspapers into volumes over the year and, and bound them into volumes because they were really important transcripts uh, of the political or records of the political transcripts. And he draws this distinction between the two material forms of the novel, uh, which shows a desire to avoid a public conflict with political elites. Uh, he argues that the printed volume with illustrations could fall into the hands of, quote, the most ignorant and incautious, which is a statement that refers to the archbishop's perception that the novel's audience was an uneducated audience, a feminine audience, perhaps, um, whereas the audience for newspapers, he, he kind of cast that as, as the sphere of, of, of the purview of elite heads of households who could um, you know, keep their newspapers because they knew, you know, how they had critical judgment uh, and, and could, could discern, right, um, and that the newspapers were such important records of congressional debates, political matters, um, and, you know, the printer himself is shrewd by printing the novel above the fold 
sort of embedding it physically into the political transcript rather than printing it along the, the, the border, the bottom as a folletin that could be kind of cut off and separated. Uh, and so you see the way that negotiations over censorship were actually rooted in, in a keen awareness about the social dimensions of how people consumed print in 19th century Mexico. Um, so this censorship case took months to resolve. The Minister of Justice actually convenes a Senate task force to review the laws and the senators basically rejected the church appeal on a technicality, um, but the decision foreshadows future legal changes by arguing that the church's authority should primarily be uh, exercised over the consciences of believers rather than their material possessions. And they sort of publish all of these results in a pamphlet that reestablishes the status quo. It's sort of a, an act of transparency that doesn't really change anything, but it does depict the church as a kind of supplicant that depends on the state's power to, uh, for material enforcement. So in the aftermath of the case, the printer claimed this as a victory in his newspaper, and he reinterprets the outcome to suit the printer's perspective and argues that the church would need to take its complaints before a civil court if it wanted to confiscate copies from any citizens. Um, and it's an argument that, that uh, more explicitly links freedom of the press with the private property rights of readers. Uh, it also implied that the church had already been definitively subordinated to state authority. Um, and so it, it, it elaborates a new political horizon for this new figure, which I call the citizen reader, right? This, this figure whose rights over printed materials should be protected by the state against religious power. So the case of the mysteries really shows how printers attempted to influence political debates, both on the page, but also behind the scenes by printing provocative novels, uh, liberal and radical printers peddled in scandal, but they also created conditions for institutional showdowns that might change the nation's legal landscape, um, test regulatory pathways and reframing questions uh, by reframing questions of, of religious morality as questions of private property. Now, religious officials had to respond to printers publishing strategies and analyze the social landscape uh, in which print circulated or else risk alienating elites for whom print served as this crucial printing uh, political technology. And in future cases, uh, religious officials actually reference this case as evidence that censorship did more harm than good and betraying, uh, I think something that betrayed the church's really eroding confidence um, in its ability to collaborate with the state, which is something that would lead Mexico down the path to civil war and the ultimate separation of church and state. And the novel itself, uh, also really sheds light on the cosmopolitan context in which Mexico City printers are operating. And I just wanted to share this partial list of, of editions of the Mysteries of the Inquisition, which became a 19th century global bestseller, um, thanks in part to this flourishing culture of reprinting, right, that, that we know was common in the 19th century. And I would love to know more about this 1989 um, Tehran edition, but it's clear that the novel really plays a part in broader efforts to implement liberalism in the 19th century. And, and as the individuals who repackaged cosmopolitan products for local consumers, um, printers facilitated Mexico's engagement with this larger phenomenon using the novel's sensationalized vision of the Catholic past to uh, articulate positions that were too controversial to express directly in the public arena. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Corinna, for that fabulous presentation. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of my fellow panelists. Uh, and on behalf of all of us, uh, reiterate our collective thanks to members of the American Print History, Printing History Association, the Grolier Club, and the organizers of this conference for an in initiative that is both long overdue, but also very, very welcome. Um, it's also my pleasure on behalf of the panel to thank Roger Chartier, who's agreed to offer a commentary live um, at the end of this session. So with that, we'll turn things over to Roger and look forward to um, uh, the conversation and questions following his comments. Roger. <laughs> 